earlier I had been operated on and a lot of the... I was physically ill as well during this period. Uh, mentally, I just totally fell apart about halfway through. I developed for the first time in my life acute agoraphobia. I couldn't leave the house. Uh, I think that this really started with this attempted murder that I felt had been intended for me. But then you have to remember that I didn't want to walk around my building because I was hearing people talking about uh, the lady with VD. And I had been very concerned when they were going to arrest me, that they were going to arrest me in the lobby of my building and humiliate me among my neighbors further. So I think this was the um, genesis of a sudden inability to uh, go out. And some of my friends were very, very good. They would come over and try to force me to get out and to just get my mind off what was going on. Uh, it worked for a while around September, October. It didn't work anymore. The one friend came over alarmed that I had not left the house for a week and uh, he said, you've just got to walk around the, the block. And I remember we stepped outside just about two or three steps and I just started crying and I said, don't make me, I can't do it, I just can't do it. And then I went home and uh, stayed inside for about two more weeks. And meanwhile, during this period of time, there was a friend, a new friend, who I met under somewhat mysterious circumstances, but he was very, very helpful and I obtained an apartment for him in my building and he did some of the food shopping that I could not get out and do. And uh, his name was Jerry Levin. And at any rate, the worst period of time was approximately two weeks before the trial. Uh, my lawyers informed me that with a federal case, there was a 95% chance of conviction. Uh, they then gave me the good news that for the trial, they wanted my parents to be seated in the front row and watch the entire proceedings. And I kept saying, we can't do that to them. It, it's going to be awful enough for them to read it in the papers. And they said, you don't understand. If your parents don't show up, a jury doesn't realize that, you know, this is what you want. Uh, they're just going to... They, they felt that the one circumstance that might get me acquitted was this unusually close relationship with my parents. <clears throat> On top of that, I was going through some Scientology material that I had obtained, and there was the name of Jerry Levin. Now, uh, I felt horribly betrayed but at the same time, I simply did not want to believe it. I was very naive, and I kept saying, well, it's a very common name, especially in a city like New York. Uh, meanwhile, we had, been, we had tried every single move possible to get the trial stopped, and, but I was in a very, very nervous state, and it became impossible for me to uh, be tested correctly, and we went to some doctors who said that they thought the only thing that might work would be if I would go into a state where I didn't know what was going on, meaning sodium pentothal or truth serum, because to do that, uh, you have to be, you're unconscious, it's like an operation. So the problem was we couldn't find a doctor who would give me a sodium pentothal test, because by this time I weighed 83 pounds, I had started at about 98, and it became very, very dangerous uh, to go and put somebody under as if for an operation when you weighed that. And I kept saying I didn't care uh, if the operation, not the operation, if the sodium pentothal killed me because if I had to stand trial for what I didn't do uh, and humiliate everyone and go through this humiliation that I would just as soon be dead anyway. And we finally did find a doctor two weeks before trial uh, who gave me a sodium pentothal test. Uh, I was unconscious for seven hours. I don't know what I said during it. I do know that when I came to, my mother was standing there and... I said, what happened? What did I say? And she just said, it's okay. It's all over. There won't be a trial. Um, the government wanted to save face because they don't like to admit that they've made a mistake. So they said that uh, they wouldn't actually, they would postpone the trial, but they would not actually drop the charges at that time. They also ordered me to see a psychiatrist, which I felt was very humiliating. Uh, the government did not drop the charges, and for two years after all this, I still had to worry on a daily basis whether one day there was going to be a trial and all of these things that I was afraid of, the publicity and so on, was going to happen. Um, the next year was 1974, and there were a number of new lawsuits against me. Uh, continued harassment, including harassment of uh, my family and their clergymen, new spies. Um, by the summer, which would be about 
seven months after the worst period of this whole thing. Uh, I remember one of my friends said that that was the first time they'd seen me smile in a year and a half. And uh, I had decided, in fact, that I was going to try to get back uh, this gentleman that I was interested in. And I threw a birthday party to have an excuse to invite him to something and sent him an invitation. And he then wrote me the most incredible letter back. And what I found out was that there was then a fifth anonymous smear letter about me. This one sent to him and his bosses. And uh, he would never talk to me again and never has. Uh, in 1975, the charges against me were finally dropped. But during this period, they started a new type of harassment. And that is I began receiving things in the mail, such as copies of... I had kept a diary from when I was 17 to about uh, 20. And there was my diary suddenly coming back to me. Copies of letters that um, I had sent out, uh, and my carbon copies of it. The um, psychiatrist report that uh, Mr. Dardano explained that he stole. In 1976, um, the charges were, no, excuse me, in late 75, the charges were finally dropped. At that point, some very bizarre things happened that it wasn't until later I would learn were part of another attempt to put me in jail. But, for example, people were, somebody was calling a number of my close friends, uh, imitating my voice to a degree that was good enough that some people had stopped talking to me, others called and yelled at me, why should I have called and been so rude and so on. I kept saying, I didn't call. And then I went to a writer's meeting and someone said, gee, how was Washington? I said, I haven't been to Washington in two years. And they said, you called from Washington. I didn't understand at the time why these things were being done. Also, at a, uh, I was with a group of writers and someone showed me a joke. And I realized afterwards that it appeared to be an attempt to get my fingerprint again. And I became very, very upset because after all, I, uh, I had a quote record, end quote. And uh, I was very concerned about the possibility of more bomb threats. In, there are many, many more things that were done to me over the years. These, this is, I'm trying to summarize a little bit. In December of 1976, I became very, very tired of it all. By that time, there were nine lawsuits against me. Uh, to, right before I went to court, all the stuff that was remailed to me that had been mailed in the past, uh, sort of a, a subtle blackmail kind of, this is what's going to happen if you don't settle. Scientology wanted me to settle quite badly. Also, they convinced me at that time that they had changed and that they really were a very nice organization and that by my continued statements and stance against them and my book, I was preventing them from doing the good deeds that uh, they wanted to do that they were doing by bringing up the bad things all the time. And in December of 76, I agreed, in a sense, uh, the easiest thing is to just say that I agreed, in a sense, not to badmouth them, and they agreed not to badmouth me. Uh, while they were telling me that they had changed, unbeknownst to me, there was a man named Michael Meisner, and he had been a top geo operative, and they were holding him under gag and handcuff. And this man knew that I had been criminally framed, and he knew about a lot of the things that had been going on. Uh, in the summer of 1977, the FBI raided the three Scientology organizations. Uh, on October 12, 1977, the uh, FBI called me. Now remember that this was a five-year period that I had never been able to prove my innocence. The government considered me uh, a criminal. I had a quote record, end quote. And the FBI called out of the blue and said, we have just received evidence that you were innocent of these, those original charges. And um, I hung up the phone and cried. And I, in fact, tried to reach that person that was no longer talking to me, but he had since remarried. I worked with the FBI for the next couple of years. I did learn before, uh, in the investigation that was, go that was going on, that the murder attempt of, on Joy was seemingly intended for me by Scientology. I learned that they had broken, Scientology had broken into my New York lawyer's office, and this was one of many lawyers they were to break into, but uh, that was the first one. <laughs>